I welcome the chairperson, Dr. C.K. Shashidharan, consultant pediatrician from Baby Memorial Hospital, Calicut. Please come forward, sir, to chair the session. I welcome our speaker, Dr. Krishna Kumar, professor and head of the department, pediatric cardiology, Ames, Cochin. Dr. Krishna Kumar from Cochin. I request him to talk on the topic, interesting cardiac case scenarios. I think it is my present duty to introduce Professor Krishna Kumar, the pediatric cardi professor, of, professor and head of Department of Pediatric Cardiology at Ames. And several occasions we had opportunity to share our views and on different stages. But of course we have got the same lineage. Both of us were mentored by the same professor attendant. We remember him uh, high esteem and uh, you can hear I, it's it is not proper on my part to extend my words but you everybody is waiting to hear from professor krishna kumar and uh, gentlemen i present you present him to you thank you uh, thank you dr sashidharan and thank you uh, to the organizers for uh, the invitation and thank you sir for uh, adjusting your timings dr santosh thank you I, I'm most obliged. Uh, I would like to start with this slide, and uh, this means a lot to me. This is Hridhyam, the congenital heart disease scheme in Kerala, the one of its kind, perhaps, in the world. Why is it unique? Because it's the only scheme that is looking to save the lives of infants with congenital heart disease and newborns with congenital heart disease in a manner that is not being done anywhere else in the country and certainly not anywhere else in the world. So this is a snapshot from the website that I have taken, and you can see the numbers of cases that have been registered. If you can see here, you see uh, this year alone, 2018, we have registered 1,800 cases, and we've operated on 665 patients, 344 infants in this year alone under the government scheme. I'm, I'm extremely proud of being a part of this endeavor because it's a unique public-private partnership. We have no distinctions between who's doing what, and we are all endeavoring to save the lives. So in this context, I'm going to show you some of the cases who have come through the screen. But essentially, my three cases will focus on one disease, which is tetralogy of fallow. And a lot has changed. And I'm going to use these scenarios to tell you how much it has changed and what is so different today with tetralogy and the way we approach it, very different from what your textbooks must be telling you. I'm going to focus on age thresholds for repair, and I'll use an example of a really small infant with tetralogy and low saturation to tell you what differently we can do in the cath lab, and we have some specific anatomic challenges. So, Essentially, all three cases centered around one disease. So let's take case one. It's a six-week-old, three-kg female infant, one of a twin. I remember this vividly because the mother came to me, she said she's had two abortions, late trimester abortions, and she says, do whatever you can to save this child. And I was wondering, why is she being so emotional? That's because she had witnessed a really bad cyanotic spell at home. The child came, uh, when the child came, he was fine. It was, the worst saturation recorded elsewhere was 40%, but the child looked fantastic, pink, and absolutely comfortable. So the child was having a 90% saturation and playing. So I was wondering, why is this mother so anxious? Because she had seen the spell, and she has lost two previous children. There's a loud systolic murmur for the 90% saturation. You can only expect that, because in tetralogy, as you know, as the spell worsens, the murmur disappears. The x-ray obtained elsewhere during the spell looked pretty bad in terms of very dark lungs, but otherwise there was nothing else available. The echo confirmed the diagnosis, which is essentially a large VSD with aortic override and a pulmonary stenosis, outflow tract obstruction. So, Straightforward case of tetralogy, echo has confirmed all the features. 
Now today when we do echo, it's different from how we used to do earlier. We pay a lot of attention to the pulmonary annulus, the main pulmonary artery size, the branch pulmonary arteries, and we try and identify what all would be the problems at surgery right away. So this patient essentially didn't have a very severe stenosis at the time of doing the echo, was looking pretty good. The branch PAs were fantastic. The pulmonary artery annulus looked good, a pure and fundibular PS. So we kind of felt, okay, this child is not doing too badly, has stabilized in the ICU. We moved the ward, child to the ward the same evening, started a low dose, beta, a, a regular dose beta blocker, 2.5 QID, iron, and reassured the mother. I was the one who told the mother, don't worry, this child has settled, and we could operate maybe, you know, when the child is four, five months of age. Mother again held my hand and said, no. I want an absolute assurance because what I saw was very frightening. And I kind of listened to her. You have to listen to mothers. So I was planning discharge, but I held off. I just waited for a day. That night, started to have, early morning, started to have recurrent spells. This one was, these ones were really bad. We maximized propranolol, got the resting heart rates to 80, 90 for a little baby and started to, you know, still not get any control over the spells. And there was wild fluctuations in saturation. So it would be 40 at one time, 94 at another time, and then we were unsure what to do because this was, you know, really bad, very dynamic spells. Then on day four, so we didn't discharge the baby. We just kept the baby and we were wondering what to do. Baby is too small, six weeks old, three kilos. What do you do? Day four had really bad spell. So severe that we couldn't record saturation. We ventilated the baby, started metoprolol and phenylephrine. Metoprolol is a beta blocker that relaxes the infundibulum and phenylephrine increases the systemic vascular resistance to enable improved pulmonary blood flow, but nothing improved. Child was having persistently low saturations, often unrecordable, and the mother was completely, dis completely in disarray. At this point, we had to take a decision, a really difficult decision. So what are the options? So you have a cyanotic, very dynamic infundibulum. How, what do you do at this stage? So we kind of debated. This is very young, six weeks old. Now, do we do a BT shunt? A BT shunt would be a disaster because this child's resting saturations in many times is 94%, so you'll flood the lungs. So BT shunt, not a good answer. Can we try something else in the cath lab? There's nothing you can try because the infundibulum opens up at times completely, so you can't do anything in the cath lab. So what do you do? So we discussed with our surgeons. I told the surgeons, listen, I think this is good anatomy. I think the pulmonary valve is in pretty good shape. You don't have to cut through it. You just have to relieve the infundibular stenosis and close the VST. And so we went ahead and did the corrective surgery. And what we do today to tetralogy is very different from what was being done five years ago, 10 years ago. We do a valve sparing intracardiac repair. So we spare the pulmonary valve. Don't cut across the pulmonary valve. The traditional conventional pulmonary valve Surgery for tetralogy used to be cutting across the annulus, putting in a transannular patch, and then relieving the stenosis and closing the VST. Today, we don't do that. Today, we make two incisions, one in the main pulmonary artery and one in the right ventricle outflow tract if necessary, and dissect around the valve, relieve the valve stenosis, but don't cut the annulus. So the valve doesn't leak. Now, that means a lot to a six-week-old. Because six week old, if you preserve the valve, their recovery is very fast in the post-operative period and the surgical results are wonderful. And this we validated, we did, we published this data and we actually much of this technique was developed by our own surgeons, uh, Dr. Brijesh, and very aggressive approach which allowed us to do, I think now over 200 babies with tetralogy of fallow, many infants, and we've had good results. So this baby was, did really well. And one of the most gratifying experiences I, have, I can recall in the last six months is this child going home, doing so well, extubated on day two, and we fixed the child's heart. We didn't have to think of anything else. No BT shunt followed by another surgery. Uh, and it meant a lot. So this was really, this case was to illustrate to you what is different with surgery of tetralogy today. Very different from what it used to be five, 10 years ago supremely good results. Our surgical mortality is less than 1%. We operate on little babies, on infants. This is not the smallest we have done. The smallest total correction we have done is 2.4 kilos. 
So you can go down to very low weight, but the anatomy matters. The valves have to be preserved. The annulus has to be adequate, and you can actually send these babies home. Just to go through spells quickly, the important thing to sp in spells is to gauge the severity. And then that's a bit of an instinct, but if it is severe, if it's not severe, it's likely to reverse. You don't have to do too much. Don't add to the triggers. Minimal handling. Do not stay, separate the child from the mother. You don't even need an IV line in those situations. Allow, teach the mother to hold a, a knee chest position if she hasn't learned it already, and watch carefully. But if it is severe, the child desaturates, then you have to be aggressive. So there are two extremes. One is no touch. Don't come near the child. The other one is get really aggressive. So then you have to take the child into the ICU, pay attention to the airways, get access. You need to sedate for access sometimes with subcutaneous morphine or intramuscular ketamine. Monitor, you have to. ECG, pulse oximeter, give fluid. Number one treatment is fluid. 10 mg per kg, saline, plus or minus soda bicarb. Got to give fluid. It's the most effective thing. And morphine, of course, additional doses if required, beta blockers, and I think esmolol is often not easy to get, so you can start metoprolol 0.1 per kg over five minutes, you can give infusion. And if it persists, you can try phenylephrin, but then you should know when to stop all this and go for something definitive, which is to paralyze, ventilate, and do emergency surgery, which could be correction whenever feasible or shunt if it's not feasible. Those are rare occasions. So what is the optimal age and weight for tetralogy repair? Questions for the audience. And I'm going to take two scenarios, asymptomatic infant with 91% resting saturation. You know, comes to your OPD, it's come for a usual vaccination, and what they'll ask you again, out of curiosity, the parents will ask you, when do you think we should get, her, get the baby operated? So what's your answer? Four months. Four months, a little early. Yeah, I mean, we do it at four months, but I think six months is a reasonable, four to six months, actually, I would say it's okay. We tend to be, so it's no longer necessary to wait for a year. And that's the bottom line. Why not four months? Not all units are getting excellent, uniformly excellent results. So I wouldn't try to generalize the results of our unit to every other unit. So some surgeons are reluctant to do it at four months. But at six months, many surgeons today are comfortable. Those very surgeons can be persuaded to do it at four months in this circumstance, which is a symptomatic infant with frequent spells. What is the answer here? Any time, irrespective of age, any time after one month, four months, and six months. You, the story I showed, told you is an example of a child who got operated at six weeks. Now, can you do it in the newborn period? Now, the answer to that is that in very selected institutions. So when you try to correct tetralogy in the very, very young, the newborn period, the results are not as good as older patients. They tend to stay longer in the ICU, especially if you cut across the annulus. So the newborn tetralogy is slightly different ball game. Certainly after one month, it becomes a lot easier to manage them in the post-operative unit. But all this is changing, so different from what it used to be and what your teaching might have been. So that's the story with one case. I'm going to tell you another case, which is a small infant with tetralogy and persistently low saturation. Now, there's a difference. Previous case had good saturation with spells. This one's got bad saturation throughout with further worsening in spells. Two different entities, blue babies. Now, this baby is blue to see. Other one is pink in general, but gets blue during spells. So this baby came from Tamil Nadu, three months old, blue, breathless, poor weight gain, uh, birth, daily birth weight was 2.3 kilos, 3.87 at three months, so failure to thrive, poor saturations at rest, 50 to 60 percent, with worsening and further worsening during spells. Child was somewhat dysmorphic, and this is the anatomy we had which is not exactly tetralogy of fallow, but there was membranous atresia, which means that there was no forward flow into the pulmonary artery and relatively small pulmonary arteries, and the pulmonary arteries were fed by the PDA. So in this particular situation, we have to do something slightly different. The conventional treatment in this situation would be to consider maybe BT shunt, because it's difficult 
if you have pulmonary atresia, to restore the full anatomy uh, in such a young child. So BT shunt is the traditional approach. You could be very heroic and try corrective surgery, but then you have to put these very small conduits which are not available. So here's what has happened remarkably in the last 10 years. We found a way to stent the PDA in many such babies. So it's now become a very popular way of handling these patients. So in this baby as well, we took up the patient, of course the child became very sick in our setup, and we went ahead and implanted a coronary stent, which we now do on a regular basis for all newborns with duct-dependent circulation as an alternative to BT shunt. So in our institution, the number of cases of BT shunt has come down by 90%. We hardly do that surgery because it's been replaced by this procedure which is less invasive in the cath lab. It needs a certain amount of skill. What we do is we usually access the axillary artery. You can see the axillary, uh, the subclavian artery right next door. So we, uh, in this case, it's the innominate, but we often find our way with the, with via the innominate artery and get into the duct and place this coronary stent, which is fortunately ideally suited for the, BD, for the uh, PDA as well. So now it has become the procedure of choice for neonates with duct-dependent pulmonary circulation, and we've done over 120 such procedures in our institute, and the results are definitely, immediate results are superior to BT shunt in terms of less morbidity, you don't open the chest, and uh, child recovers relatively fast. The only downside is that within a few months, you need to go back and do the definitive surgery because this doesn't last as long as a BT shunt, but certainly has become one very good way of handling it. So here's the final case, similar situation, tetralogy with infant with severe resting desaturation, but there is a difference in this particular case. So this is a five-month-old child of a migrant worker Tetralogy with very small pulmonary arteries. So small that it's difficult to consider many treatment modalities. And recurrent spells was actually having a refractory spell, unrecordable saturation, needed ventilation. And you can see the dark lungs in the chest x-ray. So this was the anatomy. So the pulmonary arteries are not developed at all. And this becomes very difficult because you can't correct this surgery. You can't you know, close the VSD because the blood will not go forwards into the pulmonary artery and the right ventricular pressures would become extremely high. This patient had two millimeter pulmonary arteries. So you can see the Z scores are minus 6.5, minus five. So really, really small. If you try to do a BT shunt in this patient, you will not be able to get guarantee flows. The shunt will get blocked. This child did not have a PDA, was too old for it. So how do you handle this patient? So in this patient, your management options are limited. So here's, a, here's what we had in this patient. We took the patient to cath lab, and you can see the pulmonary arteries. Even for someone who's not trained to look at angiograms, you can see they are really, really small. So the idea behind taking this patient to cath lab is to stent the right ventricular outflow tract, which is what we now do as our first line of therapy for such patients. For tetralogy with small branch PAs, it's our first line of therapy which dramatically changes this patient's outlook. And this child immediately improved to 85% on deployment of the stent, and he's still following up, doing well, and we're planning a definitive surgery. Within a month, his pulmonary arteries grew. He remained 85%. And this is, again, some a procedure that's becoming increasingly popular with challenging patients with tetralogy, uh, and it offers quite a bit. You can even do a balloon pulmonary valvotomy alone. And Dr. Rama Devi, who works in MIMS, Koiko, trained under us. And when she was a trainee, she wrote the paper on balloon pulmonary valvotomy alone. But that's for selected cases who are predominantly valvular stenosis. And it allows you to buy time. So just the cases that I have illustrated, the idea behind doing so was to tell you what has changed with tetralogy. Surgery has changed. Outcomes are better. We're doing them at a younger age, and we correct them without destroying the valve. So all this is very different from what it used to be. And if you can't do all this, you have options in the cath lab, which could be a stenting of the arterial duct, balloon dilatation of the valve alone, or stenting of the right ventricular outflow tract. 
So very aggressive approach has changed the outlook of tetralogy in a dramatic sort of way. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Krishnamurti, for a meticulously planned new approaches in the management of congenital heart diseases, and that has saved so many infants in our state as well as from outside. And it is something really rewarding for this institution and for Krishnamurti himself. <laughs> Any comments from the audience? We've just had our consensus meeting. Uh, of the Pediatric Cardiac Society of India and the results of the consensus will be published in Indian Pediatrics. It's an update on the previous consensus statement and we are recommending six months as the ideal age and we could operate earlier if they are symptomatic. Is there any specific uh, facilities that may be needed to operate at six months compared to one year? I think if your center is capable of doing newborn heart surgery, then you should be able to do a tetralogy at six months. And today, in 2018, we have to understand that only newborn heart surgery and infant heart surgery saves, really saves lives in congenital heart disease. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Dr. I hope we can conclude this session. I request Dr. C.K. Shashidharan to hand over a memento to Dr. Krishna Kumar. I also request Dr. Krishna Kumar to hand over a memento to Dr. C.K. Shashitara. Thank you, Doctor.